Friends Podcast. Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I am an Impressionist Realist Painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosnan of Steve Brosnan's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie, and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Clyde JKL. I'm the host of this podcast. I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, volcanicals, birds, and whatnot. With a tight illustrative hand and watercolor, pen and ink, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. And welcome to the Artist Friends Podcast. This is Clyde JKL, and you are listening to episode 71 for Monday, November the 16th. And I am here with my two best artist friends, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. And hello, Diane. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Constance. Hi, everybody. Hi, Constance. <laughs> Hi, Clyde. Hi, Diane. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I really, you two are are keeping me sane. You keep me company here every Monday for my lonely world <laughs> as a working artist. Okay. If our listeners will go to www.talkartpodcast.com. That's talkartpodcast.com. You will see our information page with our link. And this week I selected two videos kind of talking a little bit about um, art history and that's our theme is uh forgotten artists or lost artists yeah and the first video was with the talking about the impressionists the uh, forgotten impressionists and um i'll let diane lead off the discussion on the did you uh know of those artists that were presented in there diane or yeah, I've heard of them all before. Um, well, they talked about, about Degas, or Degas, <laughs> Degas, however they want to say it, um, quite a bit. But, um, and how his family was kind of aristocratic, and he was like basically a spoiled brat and didn't do <laughs> things the way they were should have been done according to them. And how he kind of was stepping outside his... Uh, or their comfort zone, I guess, <laughs> trying different things and doing experimental kind of work, even though he had been trained like um, in the old style of creating work, he kind of branched out from that and <laughs> took it into his own hands and did some things that they didn't really approve of too much. But um, And then they talked about the a lot of the uh, women um, artists, impressionist artists, so, and they, I guess that was the first time really that there was women, a group of women that were actually allowed to be shown, you know, to be in shows. Absolutely. They Although were- they were in with the Impressionists, which probably, <laughs> they were kind of an outcast group of peop- of artists from the traditional artists at the time. So that was their foot in the door though, at least. Women. Yeah, they were re- more recognized along with the impressionist group instead of just being an afterthought 
years later, okay, we found these ladies who were impressionists, you know, but they were all, they were included in the shows that were being showed at that time, which was a, a new voice. You know. yeah, it certainly was because there was no women's liberation back in the uh, 1800s <laughs> in France. I mean, you were actually, as women, you were discouraged from being an artist. Oh, you don't want to do that. No, regardless of how talented you were. So, yeah, when I think about the, the when I hear, hear how they uh, managed to uh, establish a career and to establish themselves as artists, it was really quite remarkable. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. The, the barriers, you know, they had to deal with, you know, and everything. So um, it was uh, a little interesting. Now, there's one, and I didn't write down my notes. I didn't write down his name. But there's one of the, in the last part of the video, uh, I think his name starts with a G, a Krieg or Krieg or, or something like that, who what, came from a very wealthy family. They were bankers, and he himself was a banker, and he decided – he was older, and I guess he was like in his 40s, you know, and he uh, uh, decided to uh, become, uh, you know, pursue a professional career as an artist, and he uh, built uh, a fancy studio in his uh, top of his uh, apartment building, his mansion where his family lived, you know, and uh, uh, what was interesting was uh, he, the workman who was uh, re- refurnishing uh, the uh, re- varnishing his studio the wooden floor he actually did a painting of them yeah and it was really rather uh, outstanding and rather strange because even all the impressions they were always doing you know the the country life and a little bit of the aristocratics and you know and he was this ordinary workman. He was painting, and and he uh, his his he found a a delight in uh, you know one of the few artists of that time period who uh, kind of painted you know common people. It was considered common people, you know the the street people, you know and workers. And yeah, you're talking about Calibo. Um, that was yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, and he did that, and he and and also Degas did like prostitutes and stuff. They, he didn't do like, you know, necessarily the aristocratic type people. And he did a lot of the um, like ballerinas at the yeah. opera house. Well, that ha- opera house was unbelievably beautiful inside. Uh, yeah, they were. <laughs> that was those, crazy. I love that series of of artwork that he did. The ballerinas that just. You're just, I mean, when you get up close to him, you can really see the impressionistic style, even with pastels, the way he did them, because, you know, the faces, nothing's really detailed. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's just, it's very impressionistic, which is beautiful. And, yeah, I know. I figured you would like the God's pastel, you as a pastel artist. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate it. It's work. I mean, to get to see it. Oh, and, and pastels is one and the same. I mean, that's all, you know. Yes, he did oil paint, but he was more known for his pastels, you know. Uh, a, uh, you know, a, a Degas pastel was, you know, very cherished. You know, collectors, you know, and mm-hmm. over the world, in, you know, in museums, you know. Well, they talked about two of the, his different views, like how the, the views that he took when he depicted as the ballerinas and even the other people, it was either from below looking up at them or above looking down, which was really different from what was being done at the time. So that was like a whole step out of the, <laughs> the norm. <laughs> one, of the, one of the other artists that was mentioned was uh, Gauguin, but mm-hmm. it was a different uh, perspective because, you know, we, oh, the, the, the history you know, a lot of your collectors and your, uh, what you call your historians and and critics, you know, they, they know Gauguin was a friend of, of Van Gogh and was Gauguin was wild and was a fighter and, and womanizer, and they, they emphasize all that. But in reality, before, he didn't pursue that life until, like, he was in his late 40s, you know, and he, he you know, whatever. But before that, he was a... a a very staunch family man, 
he very much liked being married and, and having a family. And they were, you know, a lot of his work, his early work, you know, was all centered around his family, you know, pains of his wife and his children, very, very loving and, and very passionate. And, uh, you know, I didn't know that about Gauguin. So I thought that was really, for me, that was interesting. You know, that's why when they said the, the lost artists or the lost, you know, because these are lo- these are lost facts. You know that that kind of get lost in history, and you know we develop this uh, this image of, of these artists and their uh, their when you know a lot of them lived they lived dual lives. You know, two and three different lifetimes. You know, were in in their career, and Gauguin was one of those. Because his, his later career was when he was you know into the you know after he went to Tahiti. And the thing about it is. Uh, it wasn't really, he, he went to, to Tahiti because his wife left him because he, he tried a normal life. He tried normal jobs and he had a very difficult time providing for his family because he had a very large family, but they said he had, I mean, what, six or seven kids, something like that. Yeah. And, something like that. I don't remember exactly. And he had a hard time for his family. Every job that he took, non-art job that he took. He ended up failing, you know, he just wasn't successful. And, and, you know, his wife left him because he took the kids and left because, you know, he couldn't, he, he couldn't provide, you know, for him. So he, at, could, he just couldn't cope with it. It just was not his nature to be a work at a job, you know? So. Yeah. yeah it, he had, he had that, he, he, it's like when Paul Klein, you know, made a comment, he was an artist. <laughs> You're an artist, you can't help it. It's something in you. You have to do it. Gauguin's a good example. He had to be an artist. He had, you know, he couldn't do anything else. And so, you know, he went to Tahiti to, to you know, to, to get away because his, uh, you know, to console himself. And and he led that bohemian life as a result of losing his family, you know. And so when you understand that, that's what I like. These a lot of these documentaries because if you don't pay attention to the critics, but really look at some of the historians and you look at the inner, then you start understanding. And they show in a video, you know, they show their art. You start understanding, you know, why, you know, the the other side, the the artists, they become far more real. And 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 for me, they kind of resonate. You know, that we can understand why because they didn't out of the gate; they weren't famous. Yeah. yeah 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 they had lives and they had families and you know ups and downs and stuff just like everybody else so, struggling and a lot of times it did affect their art absolutely so. speaking of that then the second video and i re- thoroughly enjoyed the second one when i found it, it was the barbarians the art of the barbarians because when, when you know history tells us you know the barbarians you know, <laughs> So many line because you know they uh, the fall of the Roman Empire was due to the barbarians, and I like when uh, he uh, he's in this museum and he shows a painting uh, a painting standing from a painting, and it shows this uh, naked man you know climbing up on the shoulders of another man to rip down <laughs> the back of people, you know and he said this this is a depiction of the bar- barbarians sacking Rome, but in reality they. <laughs> They didn't go around naked. And I like what he said, because he said, actually, because of the barbarians, we wear trousers today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't for them, they'd all be wearing the togas. Um, the togas. <laughs> togas, yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine riding a horse? I cringed when he said that. <laughs> it cannot be easy riding a horse in togas. I can get it. it cannot be easy. <laughs> the wind starts blowing your skirts. I don't up think it'll be happening. <laughs> they rode horses. That's how they attacked Rome. They were excellent horsemen, you know. Is that they mm-hmm. so they could ride horses? Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought it was interesting how the barbarian. You know, people to say barbarians, and you think of you know these wild people that are like. <laughs> you know, living off the land or something. They're just like totally wild and uneducated and all that stuff. But that's not really what, what they were. And it, the, um, it was more of a um, name for their clan or their mm-hmm. tribe or whatever. And the, the name, the 
word now has bad connotations to it. And it's just like, what was the other one? Um, it was the barbarians and the... Well, the Visigoths. Yeah. The Visigoths. Yeah, well, uh, the Goths, and there was the other one. Um, uh, Attila was... the Hun was in that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what is the other one? I write it down here. Let's see. It was an, it was a word like that that's got a bad connotation today, but it's, it's yeah. it was yeah. really the name of their tribe or whatever. Yeah. yeah. There were still several different branches of Goths also. Mm -hmm. Um what is it? And that's not anything like the goths around today either. <laughs> that was kind of funny. Yeah, that is. <laughs> it, the goth, the kids that are goths today probably wouldn't even recognize what the goths were like back then. Is it, if you see, is it the agrarians or Aryans? Aryans, yeah, yeah. So the Aryan, there were Aryans, but they were. That wasn't the one. Their portrait of Jesus, portrait of Jesus. Because uh, they built all these bathhouses and put all the mosaics up, the religious mosaics up in the bathhouses. And he was, they did their own version of what they thought Jesus should look like rather than um, what he may have really looked like, which we don't really know for sure nowadays. I mean, well, I was surprised that the barbarians were actually Christians. <laughs> yeah. You, know, you wouldn't think of them as, of having a religion or you wouldn't think of. Then you think of you know from that word you think they were like honoring you know multiple gods or like weird yeah things. yeah <laughs> you wouldn't so, think that they were they went around uh, pillaging all the time you yeah, know gaining yeah. ca gaining in territories and yeah you know. the Roman Empire you know was was the power the superpower of the time and of course they were you know it wasn't a <clears throat> Several hundred years later, before the Roman Empire became Christianized, you know, but at that time they were, you know, the pagans, and uh, yes, the Christians were, uh, you know, they lumped them all together with the barbarians, you know, and everything. Mm -hmm. What was interesting was the the art of the barbarians that, uh, you know, okay, you history portrays them as you know these wild people and vicious, and they attack the Roman Empire and they kill people and everything. But when you look at their art, you get a comfort. Yeah, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All that tile work. Yeah, the mosaics. You know, and then the dishes that they had, the gold. Oh, you yeah. You know, they made their own, they made their plates and their accoutrements or whatever they call it. You know, the cook pots are, were one out of iron, but all of their, all of their dinnerware was gold, you know. What I found very interesting was it was the Visigoths. Uh, they uh, they were the ones who made you know a lot of their, their gold, and they said there was tons, pounds and pounds of tons of, of gold. They even made jewelry for their horses. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> the horse and everything, and the garnets and stuff. You know, uh, mounted into the metal. You know, when you research, you would think, well, they were they were miners. You know, they had good mining operations. No. I pillaged. <laughs> pillaged, but more importantly, that gold was extortion for the Romans because the Romans tried to pay them off to stay away. <laughs> they, said, they just melted it down and just the coins down and made something else out of it. <laughs> they found documentary, you know, uh, evidence of where the records of where the Romans were paying, paying pounds, tons and tons of gold coinage you know, to keep them away. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I didn't think about it, but where was gold even coming from at that time? I, I know you have to buy for it. I mean, we know where it comes from here in America, you know, Alaska and California during the gold rush. But um, I think a lot of it was coming from Africa. The gold? Yeah. The, so there's gold in Africa also? Well, I mean, I don't have a lot of knowledge about except for what America, well, you know, the gold sources in America. But that's way a long time ago, and that was a lot of gold. Oh, yeah. But the, I just wondered if they had mines for it or where it came from. The Roman Empire, you know, stretched all across, you know, uh, the Mediterranean and the, into northern Africa. And during that time period, you know, it's all been depleted now over the year, year century. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was very wealthy. You know, that was, that's the only reason. The only, it's interesting. Unlike um, modern-day uh, uh, 
superpower, modern day empires, you know, where, you know, they, they either, you know, conquest a country to help rebuild the country, a, a country or to, you know, help the population. No, in the Roman period, uh, if they uh, attacked a country, took over a country, it was so they could pillage its resources, period. You know, mm-hmm. they, they, you know, and if, uh, you know, they were all over, you know, like I said, the Mediterranean and all over in, in Africa and all the northern part of Africa because it was rich in uh, minerals and, you know, and, 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 uh, uh, jewelry and, and precious, precious, uh, uh, stones and gold and silver and, you know, they, uh, you know, that's the only reason why they took over those countries. Otherwise, they would have probably left them alone because as far as, and they, and of course, then they made, you know, slavery out of the people, you know, and everything. And, uh, yeah, it, in one sense, the Roman empire, like I said, they're, they are the basis for, you know, Western civilization. They're, but their literature, literature, because they blended in, you know, the Greeks, Greeks and everything. So, yeah, in that sense, you know, they, contributed to our development of the you know western civilization but on the other hand they were extremely vicious <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's how they conquered all that but it was a, they were spread out over the whole uh continent pretty much yeah at one point yeah absolutely and you can they find had a very large territory by the toward the end of their reign you can find Roman ruins, you know, uh, all over. I mean, yeah, Roman ruins in England, Roman ruins all over in Spain and in France and, and, uh, over in, uh, Yugoslavia and, uh, you know, all, yeah, all the way down to, you know, in, in Africa, down in the, you know, around the, the Egypt, you know, and, and there, so, uh, they're, uh, they, yes, they, they were, they were pretty much everywhere and they, they did develop they were very good they built good uh, roads you know so that uh, hey you gotta have a way to get that gold back you know back <laughs> so you know that's why they built roads and and then they built good you know encampment military establishments you know to protect it and everything and uh, i feel very fortunate and blessed because when i was uh, in the navy and safe to go and living in italy let me tell you i every opportunity i took to go visit, you know, some, uh, the ruins, some ruins and, and because they were everywhere. I mean, I lived in an apartment complex and the field behind was, was a soccer field for the kids to play in, but, uh, surrounding it was Roman ruins. Yeah. And I would go and be looking at those and ex- climbing over and exploring. And a lot of it was covered with graffiti, which was really saddened me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it, it, it was interesting, you know, was, and there was caves, different places I would explore, you know, in a cave, go down in caves. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think I think us as like U.S. citizens, we're not used to having a history that long, you know, that far back. I mean, mm-hmm. but in Europe and those countries over there, they have history that goes back so far. It's just crazy. <laughs> it's hard for us to relate to it a little bit, I think. Our oldest history in this country is from the Native Americans, where they, you know, drew on the side of mm-hmm. cliffs in, in caves. Absolutely. You know, you know so, but, uh, but compared to, you know, the rest of the world, yes, it's very, very, it, it, it's very, very, uh, it's a very small percentage. We're still a very young country, you know, uh, and, you know, for us, it's something's 50 years old or 100 years old, you know, we, we call it old. <laughs> a thousand years old over there before, you know, it's old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we uh, got a little off off topic there, but that, that, yeah. that uh, <clears throat> it, it really, I didn't realize that the barbarians were so artistic. I, I followed, because, you know, what I studied in school, you know, they were barbarians. They, were, they, they, they led to the fall of the Roman Empire, and they destroyed things, and they killed people. And but when you look at their art, they, yeah. history has they were very cultured, really. Yeah, mm-hmm. Very, very cultured, and uh, the uh, so I hope you two enjoyed those videos. At least I enjoyed them, and I hope our listeners will take the opportunity to visit uh, www dot 
talkartpodcast.com. That's talkartpodcast.com. And the links are there. And uh, take some time. They're, each video is about an hour long. And uh, take some time. And, uh, I, you know, hey, that's why I love YouTube. There's so much. I can go down a rabbit hole. Not getting <laughs> there are so many. That's an easy thing to do. One video after another. And I love history. So for me, it just feeds, it just feeds my, yeah, I'm in, I'm in heaven. I can watch a, I can watch a historical uh, video, drop of a hat. <laughs> <laughs> the last video I thought was really interesting because uh, this, this artist, um, she doesn't make videos that often. But when she does, really got it, into, it was just a little 10 minute one when she said, uh, I thought it was kind of, you know, funny, uh, things not to say to an artist. Have you ever had any of those things said to you that she mentions? You know, I, I'm going to have to, I forgot to watch that one. So I, you guys are going to have to cover that, but yeah, I know about <laughs> things that people shouldn't say to artists. <laughs> they don't realize they're not saying a nice thing when they're saying it, but yeah. Uh-huh. What about you, Diane? Have you ever, ever had that experience? Yeah. <laughs> I've had numerous people ask for donations for charities. And what I try to do is have them. Um, I have donated things to charities in the past myself, but what I tried, if I believe in the charity, but if I, if somebody approaches me and it's not a charity that I would normally contribute to, I try to get them to find a, um, a patron that will buy my work and then let the patron donate it for the, to the charity because we as artists can't take any deductions for that. We can't take other than our, you know, the material cost, which is yeah. not much compared to the, you know, the price of the work would be. So that way everybody wins if you do it that way. That's, a, that's an idea. Yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to approach it. I mean, I've given, especially with the jewelry, I've given, you know, somebody comes and I'll let them have something. But Yeah, but see, if somebody buys it, then they can write it off if they donate it to the charity and the charity gets it so they can auction it or whatever, sell it or whatever they're doing with, wanted, wanted to do with the work to begin with. And the artist gets money too, so everybody wins, really. It's like, yeah, that's true. That's a, yeah. that's a good way to handle it. Yeah. I've only received a, uh, one or two emails, you know, asking me if I want to participate in like a charity auction or something, you know, but I've, I've never had anybody approach me. The one, one thing she mentioned, which has always been in the back of my mind, uh, when she says, you know, uh, can you, somebody ask her to create a piece of artwork, but then they only want to buy the print. Uh, when handling, doing commissions whenever i complete the work i always send it in a as a low resolution postage stamp size art proof to the client because i've never had this happen but it's always been in the back of my mind that yeah they could say okay yeah i don't like it but then they'd go ahead and they take that and blow it up and sell yeah you know? mm-hmm. <laughs> and print it for themselves yeah Exactly. Yeah, I've, I've had people approach me for commissions and they want a certain thing done in a certain style and it's not even like how I paint it's like something they saw somewhere and they want me to do a copy of it basically and I just won't do that kind of thing but you well, know there's copyright it, issues to begin with you know yeah it's I, know. I, I don't think people understand the whole no the copyright thing no. at all they just think <clears> it's a free yeah, the, but, and, and the other thing is too, you, they think you're an artist, so you can create anything you want to create, <laughs> and it's something that's not even your style, or it's not even like anything yeah, near what yeah. you do. <laughs> you know, it's like it's not even related. <laughs> it's like I mean, when I receive inquiries about you know doing commissions, the first thing I do in my reply was I give my pricing, but I also say tell them look at my website to see my style of art mm-hmm. make sure that it is, you know, uh, what you might like before I even accept a commission. Yeah. I, I don't accept a commission on the, on the first, you know, first email. I send a set in exchange two or three emails. Cause I want the client to understand that, Hey, I may, I don't do photorealistic work. So if you're expecting that, you're not going to get that. You're not mm-hmm. going to be happy. <laughs> 
Yeah. So I don't even attempt, uh, you know, uh, and I've, I've never had any difficulty this long because they, you know, either they're, either they're in the, in the initial inquiry, they're say they've seen my artwork on the, you know, on, on the site and they would like for me to do a, you know, a portrait of their pet, you know, or whatever. And, um, you know, up front, so they know already up front my style and my quality and, you know, what, so there's no extra expectation, you know, whatever. And, and I've been very successful in not having any kind of a rejection, you know, but I still take, I still only send the postage stamp, the low resolution, because there's always that in back of my mind, because I've heard of, of it happening to other artists and like this elephant. Mm -hmm. That, you know, they're always, you know, they, you know, want, uh, you know, they, they want something for nothing. You know, figure, okay, if you really want my artwork, then pay the paper for it. Okay. Pay yeah, I mean, I've had people want like a five foot square painting or something, and they only want to pay you $25 for it. You know, it's like, that doesn't even cover the materials. More than that you know? for the materials. Yeah. So they you don't... can't even buy the stretcher bars for something <laughs> that big without it coming over $100. <laughs> yeah that's these are people but you just have to educate people you know it's, yeah that's true yeah, and it's you know you know be polite it's like you know her recommendation is instead of saying no i don't do that kind of work she just says well no i'm actually i'm pretty busy right now you know and that, that's a good way <laughs> to be the problem with that though is that they might come back later and say are you still busy <laughs> you know yeah six yeah. months been, you're like um yeah i'm not gonna do it <laughs> I used to. Do I think it's better to just tell jewelry them side, right, but I, yeah, not, I don't. I don't do commissions on the jewelry side anymore. I'm just, you know, just yeah, you know, almost stopped I, making jewelry. I guess I've been I've been blessed. Uh, I have never had the confrontation of well, you know, you say you're, uh, you know, you need work, but uh, maybe if you lower your prices, you. I've never had any kind of discussion whatsoever. You know, uh, I've quoted the price and they either accept it or they don't accept it. They don't, they don't come back with uh, well, can you, yeah, I'm trying to haggle. Haggle. I've, <clears throat> I, I've been, I guess I've been blessed. I've been fortunate. People respect, they respect my artwork and they, yeah, they respect me at, yeah, as an artist. And I can't ask for more than that. You know, I'm not going to, you know, uh, go down to make something out of nothing, you know, <laughs> <laughs> okay yep. we're about ready to wrap things up for this episode of the artist friends podcast episode 71 and i'm here with uh diane hunt and constance bronson and diane you got a major event coming up tell us all about it yes my show uh, that i'm in um for the oil painters of america eastern um, division is coming up um on friday the 20th the opening's the 20th and it runs until December 19th. It's at the um, Ren Renhart Fine Art Gallery in Charleston, South Carolina. So if you're in the area and you'd like to see the show, stop in or call them and um, schedule an appointment. I nope. think they're ta doing appointments because it's um, you know restricted with COVID and all that. Yeah. <clears throat> now for the people that couldn't attend, where where's the website? What's the website address where they could uh, see it? It's www.oilpaintersofamerica.com and look for the Eastern, um, the OPA show. It's the Eastern Division. And you, there's links there to um, see the paintings that are being shown. And they can find your name listed there, you know, Diane. Yeah. Yeah. They'll have the painting, the picture of the painting and, uh, and everybody's names next to them. It's I, all in alphabetical there. Last week, it looks pretty good. It looks really, really good, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This is a jury show too, right? So you, yeah, possibly you could win, you know, win something, yeah. And uh, so uh, yeah, Kathy Kathy Odom is the judge. Um, she's a pretty well-known painter, and uh, so we'll see. Keep your fingers crossed for me for Friday. <laughs> so, do cool. you want to see some of Diane's? Uh, artwork then yes go visit that uh, website at oilpaintersofamerica.com and uh the uh look at the, at the original show and um send uh send an email to diane you know to your comments you know i'd she would enjoy hearing your hearing your your comments 
Okay, that is going to be it for this episode of the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 71 for Monday, November the 16th. My name is Clyde J. Kell, and I've been talking with Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. I'm going to say goodbye now to both Diane and uh, Constance. I'll let Diane say bye to everybody. <laughs> bye, Clyde. Bye, Constance. Bye, everyone. Good night, Clyde. Good night, Diane. Good night, everybody. Thanks for stopping in. Thank you, folks. And as always, however you hear this podcast, please give us a uh, star rating and a thumbs up. Thank you so much, folks. Bye-bye. The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde Jade Kale. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and Clyde Jade Kale. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Bronson at www.etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C-B-R-O-S-N-A-N-S. Clyde J. Kale at www dot cjkaleartworks.com If you would like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends Podcast, please email cjkale at sign mystery-otr.com If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a thumbs up or star rating. And most of all, send us your comments. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons License.